from deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan. It's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorkable children and planning the revolution. Hey, folks. Hey. We're here. We're here. We have, uh, we're off our game a little bit because we normally get a show finished and out. and Sunday night. Sunday night. And we didn't because our weekend kind of got away from us. Mm-hmm. So now we're recording on a Monday night, which is... Um, a little weird. A little weird. We're going to try and do a brief show. We and always we- try to do a brief show, though. <laughs> We may have to break this session into a couple nights and then... I'm sorry, I'm, this is going to be like five hours long. So. Uh, I can't... I'll have to produce it probably Wednesday night or something yeah, like that. Yeah, do so, what we can. Yeah. Anyway. Here we are. Here we are. Um, news. We had a nice walk. We did have a nice walk. It's like spring in here. Yeah, this weekend it was upwards or even over 50 degrees yeah. on Saturday and Sunday. So yeah. we went to Rolling Hills. Rolled right around those hills. Yep, we took a nice, uh, what, three miles? Yeah, two, two and a half. Two and a half miles, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a nice trail out there. Walk with the kids. It's a paved trail, so it's not yeah. exactly rugged, <laughs> you know? By really any stretch of the imagination. But, um, you know, we we have a four-year-old, and so he's it, not like, up for Like, collapses every few a few feet. Yeah, it's kind of funny because he'll start to complain so much about how tired he is, like and then you a hundred feet. Like we've walked a hundred. Yeah, feet. and then you stop to take a break, and there's a hill, and he's literally racing up and down the hill, racing up and down the hill, it's rolling, not- <laughs> laughing, giggling, and then, and then you get back on the to continue the walk. I'm so I'm tired. tired. No, he doesn't like move. walking in a straight line. That's all. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so it was. You know, I'm. We haven't been doing this nearly enough. I carried yeah. Eleanor around for the whole time on my back, so my joints were extra. And she happily snored. All extra it. stressed. <laughs> yes, but the the feeling of of getting some exercise and you know just using your muscles and bones is something I I really crave. You know, human bodies crave it. It's not an accident. Yeah, and I'm still like. I'm suffering from lack of the walks I used to get in Saginaw, where I would yeah. go before work and walk sometimes as as far as six miles before work. Yeah, no. It was, there were some very nice things. And that was just about perfect for me, basically trying to maintain my health and weight mm-hmm. and sanity. Yeah. All three. It really helped with all three. Yeah. So, uh, we'll probably, we'll go back, we'll, well do more walks, it's getting warmer. It is getting warmer, it's, and that's a really lovely park. It is, we're yeah. days away from from uh, spring. The spring, yeah. So. It's here. It's here in our it's hearts. Here. in our hearts. <laughs> what does your heart say? <sighs> what does your heart tell you? Is that the... Yeah, that's the line. What does your heart tell you? What is that from? That's that line that sticks out like a sore thumb, sore thumb from Return of the King. Oh, about Frodo. About Frodo, yeah. So, like, so, so I think that's actually in the in the book. Is that in the book? I think so. Did I Tolkien have to, write I have to look it up. Yeah. No, but it kind of sticks out of this absurd. You know, so My, Gandalf is where it tells me that Frodo is is alive. Is alive. Yeah. And Aragorn's all. So, what does your heart tell you? <laughs> you, you know what? Like, it's been a while since I've read the novel. I'll have to alter it. I I don't think Tolkien wrote that line. Okay. We're gonna. Uh, we're almost done reading The Hobbit to the kids. Yeah. And so we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to read Lord of the Rings. To the kids. Yeah, there's only one thing to do now. I have. Did I read Lord of the Rings to them before? No, we decided not to because they were too young. They were too young. They yeah. may still be too young. Well, the older kids aren't too young. Yeah, I suppose. But the younger not. kids are too young. It's it's a it's a challenging book to read out loud. I mean, it's quite long. It's beautifully written, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, parts are. Yeah, they'll be passing out. <laughs> yes, the parts are very dull. Very dull. Parts of it but for a child, yeah. None of them have met Tom Bombadil yet. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's yeah. a good point. Okay. It's time. So, uh, books. I, I don't have anything really that I haven't already mentioned, but you've got a book. You I got. got a book in the mail. Yep, tell us. Kind of excited. It's the PK Cookbook. Um, 
by Sarah Myhill. It's actually a British book uh, published by um, Chelsea Green Publishing, and it's about the paleo ketogenic diet. Um, some of you have heard of paleo, some of you have heard of keto. This brings both of them together. I, paleo is generally a keto diet, so I don't quite get why it's... Some folks eat a lot of sweet potatoes on their paleo oh, diet. Okay. So a lot of so in other words, it's it's like technically paleo. So you try and get I mean, one goal is a maybe it's not even the goal, but one of the fringe benefits of the paleo diet is you're in ketosis a lot. Yes. You're generating ketone bodies and fueling yourself that way. So yeah. uh, So the um um Oh, so the the deal is that you want to combine those because you aren't necessarily ketogenic if you're using a paleo diet. Okay, I see. Um, but yeah, it if takes you, a little. You have to be a little more intense. A little with more intense. Lowering the carbs. Well, a little more intentional, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. if you're that intentional about it, then you know, um, it goes a long way for dental health, heart health. You know. Yeah, I I am considering trying it. I mean, many days I do it deliberately. Yes. Like with the Bulletproof coffee and a low-carb lunch. Mm-hmm. But um, I've never really gone full hardcore paleo um, mm-hmm. consistently. I've definitely oh, you've done, done a, a low-carb yeah. for a while. Yeah. And I've I've had the, the uh, carb flu, you know, yes. or the paleo flu, what they call it. Where you just when you're trying to transition to all, f- like, getting ketones. most of your calories from fat and you feel like you have a, a flu and it's a strange thing it's a strange ache, sensation tired. it's it's but yeah. it doesn't actually feel like the flu but it, you know no but it, you feel a little sick and yeah. then I found it, oh if you, it's strange if you just had salt to your food for a while like eat some extra salt it seems to improve, improve significantly it's, well, it's she's, odd. she's got a particular like uh salt recipe uh-huh. which is not not just table salt but like all these different mineral salts aminos, and stuff. aminos yes aminos yeah, okay. and mineral salts that you should use regularly to help you through the kit. like there's really no getting around that mm-hmm. but when you're when, trying to once you transition shift your body right this it, it helps relieve a lot of those symptoms yeah i know it sounds it sounds so counterintuitive but yeah. if i switch to eating all fat for a few days like you know mm-hmm. Bacon and eggs only, and bulletproof coffee only, and you know a lot of meat and whatnot. Um, and, and even like, like I, I from when I was pregnant, I yeah used some um, keto recipes just because they were very soothing, you know. Yeah. But it wasn't all meaty. Like I would have it wasn't a, all meat. Yeah, I had bone broth, squawk, broth, broth, yeah. lots of bone broth with yeah. um, like, guacamole. Or like I'd make a like a cream of broccoli soup, mayo, cream, like yeah, creamy stuff. If you can tolerate yeah, dairy, you can tolerate dairy. But this was actually um, like broccoli and coconut milk, mm-hmm. and yeah, a lot of really coconut. like the that really high, um, not gluten, the not glycerin. <laughs> what's it called? Glycemic. No, you put it. It's you make jello with it. gelatin, high jello, high gelatin content um, broth. Like all those, all that connective tissue when it breaks mm, down, okay. it makes a really rich broth. So I'd have a really rich broth with broccoli and coconut milk and various seasonings, mm-hmm. and that would be lunch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, well, what I was, it sounds counterintuitive, but you eat like this, all the extra fat you can possibly eat. You can possibly tolerate. And you, you start losing weight, like immediately. Yeah. And I feel like it has a very anti-inflammatory effect effect on my it body. It really does. Like a lot of my joint pain and and things like that go away, mm-hmm. um, and pretty pretty quickly. It's one of those things though. It's hard to get on the horse to say. Yeah. It, it it just. I think once you really get into the groove of it, it's good. But then when things like change up, you know, pregnancy, moving, etc., you know, you get off the horse, you kind of. Find yourself wandering, and yeah, like, huh? Yeah, it's so I'm easy. Also, again. yeah, yeah. You, you, know you, you go out, or you or you eat what your kids want to eat one night, or someone brings cookies, <laughs> or then, someone brings food to work, and then you're right. off the wagon. Off the wagon, but, and, and, and well, you no, feel and, it, yeah. and you feel it immediately. Yeah. And sometimes it's easy to like turn the ship around, mm-hmm. but sometimes that can become a thing, and you find yourself. It's an addiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very quickly, pasta every day, you yeah. know. Uh, give us the, the name of the, the name of the book the is again. the PK Cookbook 
by Sarah Myhill and just Craig spell Robinson. My, how do you spell Myhill? M Y H I L L. Okay. Yes, and it's uh, published by Chelsea Green Publishing. I I mentioned that because you can order direct from them. You get lots of stuff from Chelsea Green I Publishing. I do. I do. So, because you one reason because you don't have to go through Amazon. Bing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I I recommend it um, with some reservation. She's a little um, what's the word? A little woo woo. I just picked it up and started flipping through it and reading, you know, skimming a bit. Yeah. And I the recipe that I, the recipes that I was looking at sounded pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And also some of the like cooking shortcuts she talks about yes i, I like recommend it make this breakfast thing and heat the tray up in the oven and then just crack your eggs on it and right let on the, the heat from the tray cook them and then eat them yeah but um yeah uh, she's a little woo woo so that's her, like a thing her writing was a little like yeah okay whatever you yeah. know like homeopathy and crystal healing kind of towards that yeah which, but you know, um, isn't, isn't my thing but you know i don't think you should let that Get no, in the way of I, I, what she has to say. I think people sh- really should be honestly experimenting with what diet works for them. Yes. Because uh, clearly the standard American diet is not working for, for anybody. A lot of people, yeah. I, it's yeah. almost no one. It doesn't seem to work yeah. for anyone. So, yeah. So, yeah um, I, I think um, her uh, woo-woo doesn't really work for me. Yeah. But, and, it, you know, but she's got good advice on what to eat. Yeah. Take what. You and know, she, try she is, try them and see. Does this work for you? Do you just feel to be good? clear, she is a medical doctor, okay. and she's been treating people for thirty years. Yeah, and that's well, how she the came, to this, like came doc, to this data. Doctor Weil, uh, you know Andrew Weil is a, a medical doctor. Yes, and when you read his stuff, you're just a little bit. Oh come on! But he does have good advice. He has good advice. So yeah. Okay, so I have some news. I have some medical news, finally. Yes. And um, I've been waiting a while to find out enough about this that I could say something one way or the other. Right. Um, Some of you who have been listening to the podcast for a while have probably been hearing me cough in the background (laughs) a fair amount, and sometimes I'm kind of hoarse and clearing my throat and all that, and... I've had a a cough and uh, related infections and issues and all that for several months now. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's turned into uh, a mild version of COPD. Right. It's just there. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Right. Um, and it gets gradually better, like... Uh, the infection part goes away for a while, yeah, and then it comes back. Um, and I have been seeing a doctor. Mm-hmm. He hasn't shown much interest in like getting to the root cause of this. And I did yeah. have some tests done. It took forever to get the results back. I had to really fight to actually get him to call me or get him to respond respond or tell me the results. I was sending emails and messages in their online system. Mm-hmm. Um, I had the test done at a lab outside his medical practice because it was right next to my office. Yep. And then they wouldn't give me the results. They can only give me And then he mother. wouldn't give me the results. He was really like theater of It was m- maddening. Yeah. And so like both his system and the system at the place that did the tests wouldn't you know give me the information that be I, a HIPAA I violation. wanted <laughs> it would be a HIPAA violation so anyway it just got ridiculous um so i signed up um i've been reading about copd mm-hmm. uh and i signed up with the alpha one foundation for a uh a test a study Alpha-1 Coded Testing Study. Alpha-1 is a genetic disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I sent off a blood sample March 1st or so Mm -hmm. and just got the results back. Dun, dun. (laughs) Now, 
it gets complicated because even trying to interpret the results is a little complicated. Right, right. It's not. Well, I I didn't think it was that complicated. So it, it is complicated. But okay. I right. mean, okay. Tell me, say what you were going to say. I'm sorry. Um, so you can either have uh, the genetic disorder. Yes. Which is two full copies of the gene. No full copies of the gene. Right, probably no full copies of the gene. Or no working copies. Right. Or you can have like one working copy. Or you can have two working copies. And then there's like a like a little mutation where it can be um a, you can be a carrier. You have part of the missing gene or you can have another part of the missing gene and you can pass that on as a carrier. Well, but to actually have no working copies of this gene is actually, that's the genetic disorder. And then you can have some variations in between where you're a carrier, and then you can have both working copies. Okay, so that's the the very simplified view. Um, the, the disease, the disorder is called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Yes. Um, and here, here's the thing, though. There are over 100 known variants of the genetic disorder yes okay it's also um so my results tell me that my genotype is called mz which means mildly deficient in this alpha one production Mm -hmm. the alpha one antitrypsin is a protein that uh Depending on the variations of the gene, you either produce a normal amount of functional protein mm-hmm. or you produce a, like a version of the protein that's not normal mm-hmm. and doesn't work right, or you produce a reduced amount, or in extreme cases, you produce none. Right. So um, I don't fully understand the biochemistry, but this protein helps clean up damage in your lungs and liver. Yes. And it also, if you produce a broken version of it, mm-hmm. it can cause damage, damage in your lung mm-hmm. and liver. Right. So um, in a lot of genetic disorders, uh, if you don't have the disease but you're a carrier, you probably don't have symptoms. Mm-hmm. In this one, some of the variations that they call being a carrier can have symptoms. Have some symptoms. So right. I, I'm just going to read this bit here um so so i'm technically a carrier uh so i'm I'm not considered so you wouldn't say i have alpha Alpha one the the full-blown disease um but i have a variation of uh i have the m gene so m is the normal one and then I have a defective gene called Z. So this uh, brochure says being a carrier is common. Over 19 million people are carriers. Mm-hmm. Most carriers are MZ or MS. It says uh, carriers may have lower blood levels of the alpha-1 antitrypsin protein, but their levels are rarely as low as those of people with alpha-1. So my... That was the, the, when I finally got the test results back, my blood level from, from my physician, first the first round, my blood level was low. Right. It wasn't non-existent. But it was low. It was lower than it, sh- than I, you know, it was towards normal. the low end of the range. Mm-hmm. And um, what does it say? People with my variation... Uh, there's a, there's a lot to to learn in short order here. The MZ Where does it say it? Is it toward the bottom of the page the MZ variation? Well, there's that's the chart. Yeah. Any I must have read this somewhere else. Anyway, it's like you have like um on average 40 to 60% of the normal level of the protein or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Um but so how can being an alpha-1 carrier affect your lungs? Alpha-1 carriers usually have only a slight risk of developing a disease related to alpha-1. 
The main type of carrier linked to increased risk for lung diseases has MZ genes, so that's me. Mm -hmm. Um, Currently, there is no known risk for lung diseases for MS carriers, which is nice, but not me. Um, uh, MZ carriers have an increased risk of emphysema. Mm. It says it's a small risk unless the carrier is a smoker or exposed to high levels of air pollution. The risk of having COPD is higher among MZ carriers who have relatives with COPD. This suggests mm-hmm. that the COPD in these families may be due to other genetic factors. So, oh. so this um, gene, this set of genes for alpha one, may be in me may be comorbid with something else. Oh right, right. And so that's um, my grandfather. Uh, on my father's side, right. I take after him physically in many ways. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. we really look alike. Really, um, it's, he's it's deceased. A weird. He died of emphysema. Yeah. Um, he had been a smoker in his youth, mm-hmm. but had not been a smoker for many years. Right. Um, and I believe he probably had this. Yeah, likely so. So the lung symptoms that might be linked to being an alpha one carrier: shortness of breath, wheezing chronic cough and sputum production that's been my recent recent experience chronic bronchitis recurring chest colds decreased exercise tolerance year-round allergies and oh, bronchi yeah. bronchiectasis i gotta look that like a, one up like bronchiectasis right yeah. so i don't i've never had wheezing i've never no. needed an inhaler until like recently december yeah Okay, um, and it helped, but it doesn't help that much. Yeah, it helps. Definitely helped some when I was sort of at the worst of right, it. Well, and it, you cough less when you use the inhaler. Yeah, so it does help. Uh, if if I go off it completely, I still I have trouble exhaling fully, and mm-hmm. my chest hurts. Um, I had chronic bronchitis all the way back to childhood. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had recurring chest colds just. Since while we were in Sag and I had like a, I was going to the doctor to see if I had pneumonia because I had been coughing one some well, like one summer for months. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, it eventually went away. Um, yeah. I've had it doesn't mention chronic sinus infections, but um, that's been the a thing. allergies. So the year round allergies. That's been a thing. So um, anyway. So all of this is somehow related. I I did, used to have a pretty high exercise tolerance. Yeah. I have a big barrel chest, and my lung capacity was actually very large. Yeah, you, you know? still actually have a pretty high exercise tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, given I don't do any aerobic exercise at all. But For um, the... Uh, so that it's not that exactly. And the shortness of breath... Breath has not really been a thing except recently. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of that is probably due to just kind of going cold turkey on exercise. Which yeah, is never a good solution. Yeah, but um, I don't know. It's complicated. So uh, so yeah, what does this mean now? This usually sh- what the Wikipedia article says is people with symptoms related to alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, the symptoms usually show up. Between the ages of 20 and 50. Oh. So I just turned 50. I yeah. am 50 now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've had the symptoms of some of these related issues on and off for, you know, going back to childhood. I mean, yeah. I was in a, I was, uh, according to my mom, I was in the uh, incubator after I was born. I was having trouble breathing. Oh, that's right. Shortly after birth. And right. that could possibly be related. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But um, I I believe that this like COPD mm-hmm. without smoking, yes, is probably related to this low level of alpha one, right? And then and or possible other like comorbid <laughs> genes not discovered yet or something. They don't, we don't know about yet. That they're not. They don't Aren't have a name thing yet. Uh, well, also we this is a higher pollution area than we'd been living in before we moved to an area with higher air pollution yeah and i started commuting in, in, on, traffic, in yeah. traffic in heavy traffic every day you've actually not done that at all in your working life as a matter of course no 
Yeah. No. And then um, I also, last summer, I was exposed to black mold and fiberglass. Oh, yeah. And that set me off. And if you think of the Alpha 1 as like the low level of Alpha 1 is basically meaning your lung doesn't recover, your lungs don't recover or recuperate the way they should yeah. from inflammation or mm-hmm. problems. And then you say, okay, now we're going to add a lot of air pollution. We're going to add a lo- uh, this. We're going to put all this pressure on your lungs. These like stressors, these things. Right. Um, it kind of starts to make sense. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. possibly also like some infections from like. Yeah, like, a, like a virus or anything. Yeah, like that. some right. viruses. Because um, I've been, it goes away for a few days and then comes back. I mean, literally coughing up like grayish green mucus, yeah. you know. More in the mornings, especially, and then recently, um, lying down to bed, uh, and when I'm lying down to go to sleep, and in the morning, I'm hearing my lungs making crackling, Gurgling. crackling yeah. noises. Yeah. There's like mucus inside my lungs, and yeah. I did get a chest x ray, that was one of the tests, mm-hmm. and the chest x ray supposedly rules out pneumonia or at least it did back in december yeah so it's not pneumonia exactly yeah it's but, the, the medical the medical intervention was profoundly unsatisfying but i've had on and off too i've had a low-grade fever and just very yeah. low energy levels mm-hmm. plus just the coughing all, you know all day at work right. like for for months mm-hmm. so which is now I'm no longer coughing all day. I'm still using my inhaler, and my chest still doesn't feel right. Right. But there's more. Oh, wait, what? So this also gives me um, uh, an elevated risk of certain types of liver disease. Mm. <laughs> so uh, no More scotch for you. Yeah, well, it says research suggests that chronic liver disease might appear in MZ carriers only when the liver has been damaged first by something else, such as a virus, chemicals including alcohol, or being overweight. So, like, I'm 50, I'm overweight. I'm not a, I've never... uh, Never been a heavy drinker. I've never been a heavy drinker in my whole life. I've always been like a occasional dabbler in drinking, you know, for... Mm -hmm like with meals or or an after dinner drink or something. Mm-hmm. But um I wonder, you know, if like uh the the weight, you know, maybe some metabolic syndrome or whatnot is all it's yeah, like yeah. because what the That's a good question. Touch it down. It seems to be the case that you don't start to feel symptoms from this disorder until for the from the liver damage or the lung damage. Until it's actually pretty pretty far progressed, oh. which was a little unnerving. Because so I'm yeah. like, like, oh, I'm just barely getting symptoms, so I still like, I haven't done that much damage to myself yet. Well, it might be the opposite. Yeah, it might be that you're getting symptoms now because there's been a lot of damage. Because the damage has accumulated to the point where it's um, problematic. Yeah. Anyway, so. So did he did he test did he test your liver function at all? Or? Um, I had all normal levels when I had that exam in October. Oh, and okay. that tested liver enzymes and whatnot. Okay. So good enough for me. But um, anyway, so the, any, the fact that I now have like a clue as to what what's happening, like right. what the root cause might be, right. suggests a course of action, which is yes. To find a doctor that actually knows something about this. Yes. Whereas, this is one reason I've been sort of waiting for these results with bated breath, is mm-hmm. because if it said, no, your alpha-1 is perfectly normal, then like, okay, I've got to find some other cause that somehow ma- makes, makes, sense makes sense of all this stuff. Right. You know, of all these issues. Right. But, um, yeah, it this sort of stuff clicks. Like, it makes sense that I have this. Right. Um. So now just like what to do. What can I do to relieve the symptoms? What can I do to try and ensure that I live as long as I reasonably can, you know, mm-hmm. have like as many healthy years as I can. Um but some of, we're probably not gonna like some of the answers like, well, you have to keep your house scrupulously clean and dusted at all times. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they'll be like, Well, 
Dad, we've had a good run. <laughs> it's been nice knowing you. Oh, um, goodness. Yeah. Anyway, so it's it's a mixed bag. It's like uh, I'm happy to learn that I don't have like the most severe form of this of this disease. That's good news. But this is a it's a thing. It's a real thing. It also means that my children have. Uh, if, you know, I really doubt 20... you have any of. Wait, you don't have any of the. It's very unlikely you have anything other than the normal genome, the MM. Yeah. No. It's it's. They say it's common. It doesn't sound that common. Like one in twenty five thousand people. Well, it's also associated with Iberian Peninsula and Northern European ancestry. Uh, okay. So I mean, maybe you should get tested, but probably more. I should probably get tested. But the likelihood of me also being a carrier is low, which means the likelihood of the children being carriers is um, like twenty one in four. Nope. Is it? Nope. What's, what's the likelihood? If you have normal alpha-1 genes and I have the MZ gene, each of our children has 50% risk of being MZ. Oh, they each have a 50% risk of, of being a carrier. Of having the same type of carrier, being the same type of carrier that I am. What's the, they have a 25, oh, they have a 25% risk of uh, not having it. No, that's not what it says. What does it say? If a carrier, MZ, has a child or children with a person who has normal alpha-1 genes, MM, right. each child has one chance in two of being an alpha-1 carrier. There is no risk that any, uh, MZ, there is no risk that any of the children will have the condition, as in like the the more um, they won't get a more severe variation f- right. from me and what's the risk is there any risk of them if a, if a carrier has children with another carrier each child has one chance in two of being an alpha one carrier each child also has one chance in four of having oh, okay. ZZ that right. means they produce zero alpha one right and uh, one chance in four of having normal genes. Right. So half likely they'll be, a, you know, if you had MZ, our kids would have half chance of having MZ and a quarter chance of being either normal or having MZ. Okay, that's right. Or that's having right. ZZ. Right. But they yeah. have, but it's just straight up 50-50 of being a carrier or not being a carrier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what it says. So oh, that so, suggests yeah. that that at least one of our kids probably probably does probably is a carrier. A carrier, and I'm guessing it's Benjamin who coughs all the time. Oh yeah. So we should find out. And now, of course, I'm racked with guilt about producing offspring with a potentially damaging oh. genetic disorder. How how could you have known? Well, I didn't know. Yeah, but and how could you? How could you have known? <laughs> I don't know. There's, there was no way for you to know. There's nothing. There's nothing to feel guilty about. Anyway, I mean, so it's not like you've done anything wrong. Well, you know the general anti-children um, sort of ethos oh, in the that. United States says everything having to do with children is your fault and likely that it's something you did wrong. <laughs> so. Yeah, fuck that. Sorry, it's just not. I, I, got no, I have no patience for that. Sorry. Anyway, so. What I'm trying to do now... No, it's a virtue, but... What I'm trying to do now is find a physician that specializes in this kind of thing who can actually like prescribe some therapies that will help get rid of these symptoms. Mm-hmm. And then basically who hopefully I can stay with over time who can monitor to see if any of these things are, getting, are progressing. progressing getting yeah. And Harming you in some way. avoid that. Yeah, because even though it says, well, a carrier, you know, is, you know, has only a small likelihood of being sick in these ways. I've been sick in these ways my whole life, on so, and off, and yeah. it's actually, but it's now getting to the point where I, it's like, when I actually have COPD, it's like now it it requires an explanation. Right, right. Yeah. Got to, yeah. Whereas before it's like, oh, I had allergies. True, I had chronic. Allergies. Lots of kids oh, have you had allergies. bronchitis. Yeah, people had bronchitis. Have bronchitis. Yeah. Oh, you know, you had a bad summer cold or whatnot. Mm, a lot of people have that. Well, not, COPD. Every, not everybody gets COPD who's not a smoker. Yeah, that's not how that works. No. Right. So there it is. <sighs> so it's uh, troubling, weird, and disturbing news. But refreshing and 
quite a relief to have information. A relief to have some information. So when yeah. I got the letter, I was like, oh, it actually makes sense. Oh, it's a fat one. Must mean something. Yeah, I've been accepted to Princeton. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, it, uh, if it said, good news, you have normal alpha-1 genes, I was going to be... God damn it. Now I still now have what? nothing to go on to explain, you know, do I have lung cancer? What the hell? What? Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, so you probably don't have lung cancer, but we'll see. I probably don't have lung cancer. Yeah. So. Okay, you want to keep going? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. It's a uh, it's tiring to record on a weeknight. We're not getting as much sleep as we need. But no. um, you've got a topic. I do. Back in December, uh, one of our listeners, uh, uh, Via, um, do you know I've never heard your name pronounced Via? So if I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, asked about sort of like our our. <coughs> political or spiritual biography like what what yeah, led us to where we are now i think know? this was after our defining our terms show yeah yeah where we talked about like how we wound up radicalized yeah what well, radicalized you yeah yeah um yeah so this was a sort of a kind of sort of a follow-up to that and but also to respond directly to the question about you know what 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 uh where we came from and where our political beliefs what they grew out of. Um, so, to that end, I've uh, pulled up a few things to try and give a biography of where I'm coming from and how I've grown in this direction. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to try. Yeah. Um, so, I, I think a lot of folks know that I started off as an activist very young and... Uh, in the womb. Like in the womb, radicalized. You were agitating to get out. Agitating even then. Um, and was encouraged by my parents to, who were activists in their own right. Now, mind you, that they, my parents never like took us as kids to protests. And like, you know, so their activism was not performative, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it was just kind of the... Well, it was your dad's job, pretty much. It was my dad's job. My yeah. father was a civil rights attorney throughout the 50s and 60s, and uh, later in his career, uh, practiced law, and um, I worked with the state of Connecticut, um, and my mother was his uh, support system. Yeah. And uh, so my mother was always like organizing from the kitchen table on our phone at home, mm-hmm. either, you know, protests, boycotts, etc., for something on something with something. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was just the background of normal family life in my home. It was your kitchen table reality. Right. And uh, so we didn't like like make protest signs and go on marches. Mm-hmm. But um, when we had dinner every night, my father would lecture. And he'd let, you know, <laughs> he would lecture in history and he politics. He was, was kind of like a, a college professor all the time. Yeah, he, and he actually was an adjunct at the... Uh, uh, UConn School of Law. Mm-hmm. Uh, we lived in Hartford. Well, I don't think I ever heard that before. They actually taught oh. college classes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So he he would frequently lecture at the dinner table. Uh, actually, that was the norm. <laughs> it's yeah. a, the dinner time conversation was a seminar class. It was a seminar. Yeah, so yeah. various aspects of history, law, and um, politics. And he was a big uh, Thomas Jefferson. Fan. I would even call him a Thomas Jefferson fan. He he loved his writing. He loved Thomas Jefferson's writing. So, don't, but don't make it all due to your dad because you had a bunch of siblings and not all of them are like leading a life of activism, right? No, I, no, they're, no, they're not. But I, although I I think it's fair to say more than half of us are pretty radical. Okay, but it, it didn't. You know, it, it, I mean, you had. I'm saying you had something to do with it. Your identity and your interests and whatnot. At a young oh, age. certainly, uh, without question. So. I mean, the, the, this is. I'm, I'm talking about the roots here. Yep. Not the trunk. <laughs> um. So that was that was um. Our, our sort of normal family life for us. 
And I think when I was about 10 or 11, I started really feeling, um, you know, moved by the things that the lectures I listened to every night. <laughs> and uh, really got into the anti-war movement. And, you know, there wasn't much of an anti-war movement in, in the early 80s. Uh-huh. Because, you know, Vietnam was done. Mostly people were resisting Reagan and, and nuclear weapons in the Cold War. Yeah. So I became engaged in Cold War activism, anti-nuclear activism, and the War Resisters League. I was a member of the War Resisters League. I was um, a little older, but uh, I was very interested in uh, in nuclear weapons, and I wrote a paper on it. Uh, I mm. did some. Uh, one of my sources was a book by Jonathan Shell called The Fate of the Earth, which is a, a, f- a famous anti-nuclear book. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I, I read at an early age John Hersey's Hiroshima, which mm-hmm. started out oh, as a, yeah, it started out as a uh, a long uh, essay in the New Yorker. It was published as a separate book. It's a, it's mm-hmm. a fascinating, horrifying book. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then also, I had a copy of a U.S. government document called The Effects of Nuclear Weapons, which was the actual scientific studies carried out at. About just how these bombs kill you. At the blast sites and how fallout spreads and all that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was, that was part of my headspace too. And then of course, yeah. l- later it was stuff like The Day After, the famous movie that scared yeah. the crap out of a whole generation. A whole generation of kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I didn't, there was nothing, because I had already had my head in that, there was nothing new. No new information. In, a day a- in, the, in the day after, except to see it dramatized like right. that. Um, so as a member of the War Resisters League and just sort of having my head full of ideas about being opposed to nuclear weapons, yeah. I uh, went down to protest an electric boat in Groton, Connecticut, as a child. Who Tell us who, I mean, just make sure everyone knows what Groton is and what electric boat oh, is. Oh, Groton, um, oh, people don't know what that is? Probably not. Oh, okay. All right, right. So it's like um, people don't know, you know, that Rolls Royce makes, you know, uh, Jaguar jet air, jet airplane. Oh, jet airplanes and air for and bomb, bomb, you know, for bombers oh, okay, and okay. stuff like. Um, so, I'm not, uh, some some people know, but I don't think it's necessarily common knowledge. knowledge. Okay, so New London, Connecticut, and Groton, Connecticut, are I think the mouth uh, is it the mouth of the Thames, or the Thames, as we say in Connecticut. Um, they're right on Long Island Sound, mm-hmm. and there's a large um, nuclear nuclear submarine base there. Okay. Um, and the Coast Guard College is there. The Coast Guard uh, Academy mm-hmm. is well, it's actually a little further north. Um, and Electric Boat makes uh, the submarines and does all the tooling for nuclear submarines. Yeah, they build nuclear subs. They build nuclear subs in in Groton, Connecticut, at Electric Boat. And uh, they go right out to the Atlantic Ocean on Long Island Sound. Um, It's their their huge employer. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they make weapons of death. That's, you know, how people pay their bills in New England and in Groton, Connecticut. Yeah, not that this is the only site in the country associated no, with but it was with the, close the, the military industrial complex and with the nuclear industrial By a long complex shot, long shot no it's but, not the only one but this is one of the, the big ones it's a big one and it was close to me yeah so i participated in a regular sort of vigil and protest and whatnot at the site and um got picked up a couple of times but yeah this was all like through high school and middle school and all the war resistors were republicans hmm and I would get rides from these folks, and we'd go down there, and we'd protest, and we'd bring sandwiches. And, you know, I had fun. Honest, honestly, I was having a good time. It was a, it was like a field trip. It was like a field trip, and or uh, field day. Yeah, yeah. And um, they, this ethos of um, anti-war conservatives and anti-war republicans mm-hmm. they, these were like these old hippies that i was hanging out with yeah. all the time yeah and mo- most of them were fair were older 
and, and like and when I say old I don't mean like 30 I mean like you know 60, 60 yeah. 65 some of them 70 at the time um, and there were folks that were in their 30s and 40s and 50s but a lot of the real the real veterans and some of them were veterans mm-hmm. uh, as in war veterans um, were in their their 60s mm-hmm. and um, you know talked a long good game about really the the Eisenhower talk about how much blood and treasure we were spilling yeah, for war the mil- about the military, Eisenhower's famous speech about the military, military industrial, industrial complex. complex right and that was their headspace about why they were there, what they were opposed to, and much less so than this sort of, I, I, I want to say, like... Left, liberal, anti-war? The sort of liberal anti-war. Mm-hmm. Because they these folks were kind of leftist per se, in that this isn't what we should do with our money. Mm-hmm. But um, they were very conservative. They these they weren't liberals. They weren't like they, they weren't feminists. Would they have been protesting the Vietnam War or not? Um, many of them were fighting in it. Yeah, Vietnam right. veterans. They, they were they were veterans. Yeah. So so, so a they, lot of a lot of Vietnam veterans kind of became war resistors. After yes, the after fact. the war, after the fact. Yeah. I mean, men that I know now. And let me say that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. No, it is true. Some there were the youngish ones that were in their 40s and 50s mm-hmm. were uh, Vietnam veterans. And the older ones were actually World War II veterans and Korea, Korean veterans. Yeah. So I'm, th- I'm trying to think back who, who was in what war. We're just different. Yeah. You and I are just different enough in ages that I remember seeing the Vietnam War on TV, and I'm not sure you do. No, I don't. I, don't, I didn't it's do just all It's just a matter of a, of a few, few years. years. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, so they're presence to me i mean so if these people were republicans well then obviously i am too mm-hmm. and my parents were agnostic politically they Did were very politically agnostic. So, so i know some judges and like people with like um that kind of position mm-hmm. they actually make a conscious decision and some journalists too right to not vote was that your dad did he not? my dad always voted he did vote he did vote um, he held it as, um, uh, I, I wouldn't say moral exactly, but like... Nearly a, sacred or sacred it's sort, sort of like a sacred responsibility. Mm-hmm. Not exactly moral, per se, but mm-hmm. a sacred responsibility that, that this was like, he was a caretaker. Yeah. And this yeah. has to be done. As, um, uh, you know, his ancestors fought for it, he fought for it, my mother fought for it. Mm-hmm. You know, how could he not vote now? <laughs> well, I, I do kind of respect this position that some people take who are activists or journalists who are said so they're not going to participate because they're not going to. Um, it's not that they don't have a clear bias. It's mm-hmm. that they're not going to be partisan. Oh, right, right. You know, they're not going to associate themselves with one of these parties. Right. Oh, no, they, they did not. They were careful not to. To register as a member of either party, either major party, See, or, or in any some, party. In some states, you can't do that. In oh. some states, you can. Yes, you can. In Connecticut, you can vote in the general election, general election without being affiliated to a party, mm-hmm. but you can't vote in the primary without affiliating to a party in Connecticut. Yeah, this is this is a, it's, it's problematic. A weird thing and it's a weird thing. A pro- and, and in Michigan, it was so problematic that I wound up unable to vote in the primary a few years ago. Oh, so, oh, yeah. For That's Obama's right. second, um, right? I, I think I, I think I remember that now. Yeah. But the so so what it all comes down to is, um, they were agnostic about political parties, and did not identify strongly with either political party. To be clear, there were some very uh, dangerous times that my parents faced in California in the late fifties, and. Um, they they had to run for their lives. To be honest, it was uh, it was dangerous to be an anti uh, racist or a, or a civil rights activist. So. It was yeah, it was very dangerous. And he was uh, prosecuting police officers for police brutality. Yeah, and um, um, it was always Republicans who tipped him off back in the fifties. Interesting. And so, like FBI members, FBI people who were Republicans would call him and say, I hear there's a problem that you should know about. I think maybe you want to move on to the next town. Was this uh, this thing with Republicans being like uh, pro-civil rights, is this some sort of a 
like legacy of sort of before the parties flipped it know? is it's like it's before the party flipped and yeah and also it, it was i i wouldn't really describe them as pro-civil rights per se i would say that if you were pro-civil rights mm-hmm. it was the party where you weren't ostracized Oh, okay. Yeah. It so makes I, sense. I wouldn't really describe yeah, it as modern, party. like modern, like liberal Democrats. They have this really rose colored view of the history of the democratic party. It's a little perverse. It, yeah. it is a little perverse. And I'm not saying the modern democratic party is literally is the same is the same. They, but, they actually you know, flipped at one point. Yeah. So. But, um, you know, and, but it's, uh, it's not, you know, in many ways it's, it's, it, there's just, you know, historians always say simplif- simplifying and comparing things and whatnot is just this fraught thing. You can't do it. And it doesn't Literally actually give you a lot of information. And that's so that's one of the reasons they resist it because it, it subtracts information yeah, it rather than actually, adds it. information. Yeah. Right. So I so I bring that up to say that he so we had this these positive experience with folks who were Republicans and were mm-hmm. publicly identified as Republicans. Yeah. And then, you know, the Voting Rights Act was actually signed by Democrats. Yeah. And that's how it actually came into law. Right. And and then and things started to change. So his big takeaway was, you know, there are good people everywhere and there are bad people everywhere. Yeah. And if I look at the platform, I'm not really on board with either of these platforms. Right. Right. So he never publicly identified as with either partisan. Part, as a partisan. Yeah. That's I think that, that that makes perfect sense to me. It wasn't like that in my family, right? You know, my mother was kind of a staunch Democrat back when that what what she was, you know, what she understood to be a Democrat was a New Deal Democrat. Yes, and in the eighties and whatnot, part of our family, the Westfield part, yes, <laughs> my grandmother's side of the family, they were staunch Republicans and mm. just always insulting at towards democrats at thanksgiving you know oh, like those just, kind of, it was so yeah. obnoxious you know oh, and that's unfortunate and meanwhile i you know i hated reagan from my earliest memory of reagan not <laughs> you know hated is the wrong word but was you know horrified and appalled and it's not appalled, even right? not even really for the the reasons that a lot of people did of like just mocking him and making fun of him i was appalled by his anti-intellectualism Oh yeah, you yeah. know no, he was he was an only template for forty five really. Yeah, and it's sort of, um, uh, what's there's a famous essay about, um, oh the paranoid style in American politics, Rich yeah. Hofstetter. Right? Yes, he he was a, a example of that to me, and, yeah, and also just exam a, a very obvious and clear example of. The presidency being stage managed, mm-hmm. you know, where like the idea that he actually had policy positions himself right. was just laughable. It was absurd. Because he didn't know anything. Right, he didn't have an opinion. You know? But yet, you know, the things he said made him so beloved by the American people. And yeah. Like, well, A lot of ordinary people really liked him. Yeah. Um, Oddly, you know. Right. And now people who never heard him speak weren't around during his presidency yeah uh revere him as as a, some kind of giant, conservative icon uh, conservative icon a luminary like the way we think of lincoln or, or jefferson or these you know these famous presidents yeah which like really? seriously yeah you, no you, really yeah if you're not old enough to remember him you don't <laughs> but for the record i'd like to point out that we started doing that with kennedy yeah yeah. Who wasn't actually a very good president, but yeah. we have this sort of haloed. We seem we seem to have him. a need to to do this. We need to do that. I don't know. And it's I don't know. It it to me it's right up there with like a royalist. You know. Yeah, it's a little weird. Like, a, but here's the thing, and this is we, we this is I'm, I'm going off track, but I need to say it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, that's I'm the dragging key. You off track. That's the key to understanding monarchists. Mm-hmm. They recognize that we need to do that and want to give it a role hmm. and okay. provide a place for that need. Yeah. No, I mean, it's pretty clear the same way that people have a religious impulse. They have a monarchist impulse, impulse. as well. They a have an of, impulse for it. A so. lot of people really do want to be ruled. And, and so 
that's what that's about. And whoever winds up their ruler, they'll assign a whole bundle of virtues to that person that really because they're there. Because they're there. Because you know, it's they it's this fun. sort of backwards cause and effect. Yes. This person is in charge of me, therefore this person must be good because I wouldn't have a bad person in charge of me. Right. Yeah. So oh, so going back to what I was talking about, like the root of this part of the conversation. Sorry. <laughs> um, my parents were political agnostics. Yeah. And they were they had a mixed marriage in that my mother was a Christian and my father was a Jew. Mm-hmm. So um, in politics, they expected us to choose our path and in religion, they expected us to choose, choose our path and provided the best example that they felt they could. Hmm. Um, okay. So for me... I'm hanging out with these conservative anti-war Republicans. You're, so I meant to me, I was a conservative anti-war Republican. I didn't know what else to think were, about myself. You were actually a, a Jewish radical. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently I've always had that. Uh, and thinking that you were a conservative anti-war Republican. Apparently. Because you, it didn't, it, you know, the, I don't know. In, in 2018, if the parties don't actually flip soon, the Republican Party is going to disintegrate, right? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the Democratic Party won't survive either if it doesn't. Not like, as it, it is. If it doesn't acknowledge its right wing, you know, base and start, right because they claim they have a right wing base and just you know own it, right? Just own it, go but, with it. And these things happen periodically. It shouldn't it's okay. be like it's not something. That, no, this you don't need to panic. Thing to fear. No one needs to panic. This happens. Yeah, and you know, usually a new party comes in. Pulls one of them, peels one of them off in one direction or another, and then they flip, and the third party eventually goes away. Goes away. The third right. party becomes dominant, and then one of them shrivels up, or, or something. This is how it's happened historically over and over again. Right. So, and and we're due. Right? We're, we're overdue. actually we're overdue. We're yeah. about fifteen years overdue. Yeah. Um. So, I was twelve. I didn't know what else, how else to like think of myself or how to sure. imagine myself, and so I said, "Well, I guess I'm a Republican too." I'm not sure why I didn't think of myself as a Democrat, but I never have really. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's I mean, I think it's because, you know, it was nice that my mom voted Democrat and I appreciated some of, like, what she did. She worked in the community mental health system mm-hmm. and she was always completely oriented about uh, towards helping people. She worked in a TB sanitarium when she mm-hmm. was younger. She was an occupational therapist. My father worked in the California state system. He was a parole officer and a psychologist, and he worked in the prison system. Mm-hmm. Right. And he was also a firefighter, like, you know, like. Right, right. Um, so both of them basically have most of their careers, they worked for the state in one form or another. Right. And they worked in what you'd call the helping professions and all mm-hmm. this. So I was always very oriented towards. You know, the community mental health movement was a Kennedy administration era uh, program mm-hmm. to to take apart the huge centralized state uh, mental health hospitals and move this function where people just got warehoused for their whole lives, you know, yeah. and move this function back into the community, into smaller facilities and fund yeah. them, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And Reagan started taking that apart. People don't realize that Reagan also killed a lot of people by taking apart uh, TB support programs yeah. and defunding TB testing and treatment. Like, Which, like Same way he killed an awful lot of people by sort of basically giggling at, about AIDS rather than doing something about it. Gay you know? people. <laughs> yeah, like, literally seriously? couldn't, the administration couldn't even talk about it. Couldn't even have a conversation. Right. So, but... um I was not a Democrat even at a young age because from a young age I've been reading about socialism <laughs> and communism. Yeah. And another I got you early, man. Another paper I wrote that uh, in college or in high school that I remember that mm-hmm. was on I did research on this was on the Fabian Society, the Fabian Socialists, Socialists. including but, yeah. a group that included George Bernard Shaw. All right, and just to contextualize that, that's the whole idea that you would do you would engage socialism gradually. I think so, yeah. Yes. yeah. And that you would move it to the, through the state incrementally. Yeah, and those ideas really appealed to me. I mean, I read, I was a crazy reader, so I, you know, I read stuff like The Communist Manifest at a very young age. Well, you know. yeah, you know. But um, just a lot about socialism. Right. And fascinated me. And, you know, so there it is. So I, I never felt really confident about uh, being a, a Democrat as far as like being an activist for a party. 
Right. But um, yeah. So, uh, but I'm not trying to derail your no. I don't think you are. I don't think I'm really because you're you're. I give a little bit of my history, a little bit of yours. But it's different. I mean, it it is. I wasn't an activist as a young person because my mom wasn't an activist. We I never went on a march as a kid. I was engaged in like walkouts in high school though. Oh, I never did. I never did walkouts. Um, We had walkouts because. Uh, I think two students in our community, and I'm really, this is 35 years ago, so I'm really stretching my mind to think back to who they were or the details. Mm-hmm. I think two kids in our community were walking on the train tracks mm-hmm. and were killed by a train. Mm-hmm. And no, I'm still to this day not entirely sure if that was like a suicide pact or they didn't hear the train or what. Strange things can happen oh, where people don't hear trains right. until it's too late. But yeah. um, there was some activism in the school that came out of that to like extend the busing program because I think they were walking on the tracks because they had had after school suspension and so couldn't get a bus home. So we're walking, walking home. Yeah. But I, in a rural I, school district, it can be very far. Yeah, miles, uh, miles, and miles. So, I don't. Again, I don't remember the exact details, but there was some activism around that, yeah. around their deaths. Mm-hmm. And there's other activism too over teachers that were being fired or being disciplined, and you know, people were walking out in support of certain teachers and whatnot. Yeah. You know, I don't recall all the. Were you suspended? Details. I was actually a pretty goody goody kid. Yeah, I never too. got suspensions or detention. Oh, even. Uh, that was a, no, I did get suspended in high school. Yeah, I had I had, I had into school suspension damn near every day in my freshman year in high school. Talk about how you were basically because of your class. Oh. See, this is the thing. I was a trailer park kid, right? Oh, but yeah. but you because of your class were like nearly immune to the consequences that would have gotten other kids into trouble. Oh yeah, that's true. I think that's an important thing. That's an important detail. Yeah, no. So I was picked up by the police in high school for my protest. Your protest, right? And I would call my father, <laughs> the judge, and they would be like, "Well, let's." Not take her in. How let's about just, that, guys? Let's, let's just, just pretend we didn't see her. Let's just give her a ride home and a pat on the head and, and maybe a cookie. Yeah, maybe a cookie, too. And then my um, in high school, I, I'm i almost embarrassed to tell this story now in terms of its, its, its class, with its class uh, implications. Yeah. But in high school, my freshman year, I did not like my biology teacher, and she did not like me. She was feeling was mutual. <laughs> and I... Um, was always misbehaving and kind of sassing her and talking back. And she would always give me detention. And um, if I served detention after school, I had to miss uh, sports practice because mm-hmm. I was a jock. Yeah. And um, my coach didn't want me to miss practice. So he talked to my biology teacher and she arranged for me to have in school suspension. Mm-hmm. And I said an in school suspension and a kid threw a fetal pig at me. <laughs> high school is so weird it's so bizarre which and it my, was even weirder back when you and i were in it yeah well, just uh, yeah really theater of the absurd high school it really is oh, it's just it beat ridiculous. up so many times but. and my parents didn't like that that i was you know as my mother said assault it with a pig <laughs> assault it with a pig <laughs> so what Sounds happened? Like a police action or something. The negotiation from there was that I would serve my detention, and really, it was absurd. I had detention like two or three times a week in this class. <laughs> I would serve my detention. I, I'm, you know, and I never got suspended. It never became like it never escalated from there. I would just have detention. I would serve my detention during my study hall. Uh huh. So I would go and I would clean the biology classroom during my study hall. Wow. And. Okay. Keep talking, I've got to look at the computer. So um, every day during my study hall, the vice principal would walk by and wave at me and say, hi, how you doing? Sometimes we'd chat, et cetera, et cetera. After like a month of this, he walks by, I'm in this room, I'm cleaning and we're chatting. And he says, so why are you here? (laughs) And I was embarrassed to say, that I have detention three times a week. 
<laughs> it hardly counted as detention. <laughs> it hardly counted, but that's what I was supposed to be doing. I think I only had detention like once, and I never was suspended because it would have been too hard on my family. family. Right. Yeah. Right. Whereas for me, it turned into like my family was like, well, she's not serving detention like that. I mean, my mom wasn't even, I was a latchkey kid for right. a lot of high school. And then I had a job after high, high school, school too, after school. So it right. was like, it would have blown a lot of things out of the water, water. and required my mom to leave work and all this. It just wasn't. All kinds of cascade. It wasn't feasible. Right. So when he said to me, so why are you in here? I kind of hesitated. He said, oh, are you doing like, like community service? I'm kind of like. Some kind of something virtuous, right? Is this a, so this special smart virtuous kids program? <laughs> or something like, like some like, oh, I don't yeah, even know yeah, what. That must be like it. there's some there's some kind of thing, I forget what it's called now, but like um like what you, you do is some kind of service project, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like Yeah, yeah I'm doing a service project. It. That's exactly what I'm doing. That's what I do. So it was this sort of like um uh, 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 lie by omission or just like a great smile and nod and lie. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Course. That's exactly what I'm doing. And never spoke of it again. <laughs> and he went away and would wave occasionally when he walked by and I served out the rest of the year in my detente with my biology teacher. <laughs> um, when I was graduating yeah. and I was reviewing my transcript, he actually gave me credit. Like, that was a credit class. Oh, my God. So, I actually got credit for my detention. He gave you, a, like, some like kind a, of service class credit. Right, like a half credit for my, the service project I did my freshman year. Even though he didn't know what it was. It didn't was know what it was. It's like, like oh, oh. oh, that's right. I, I, I saw her there, and she was yeah. doing this. She should get credit for it. This is... That's what that's class privilege. privilege. That's class privilege. Yeah. That's what that is. Yeah. And... No, class privilege for me was watching kids like you become national honor I'm students sorry. because they cheated off me i never cheated on and, the test okay but and that because they won the popularity contest right uh, yeah i i did lie that one time but <laughs> uh, but i never cheated on a test but no like the national that. honor society kids you know i mean i, I was, was better me. than them academically right they cheated off me and yeah. they got the t- student. Yeah, they got the awards. They, they needed because it was a teacher recommendation thing. Right. You know, you get a couple of letters of recommendation. So that's that's a matter of, you know, being good at politics even at that age, yeah. and also or and or having parents who are politically, you know, connected. politically connected or right. you know, and not you know your parents aren't working full time. You right. know, or, <laughs> you're not a latchkey kid. You're not. Under, right. you know, underprivileged in some ways, right? Right. So, so that was my high school experience, and was uh, of really riddled with privilege in lots of ways. Yeah. Um. Understanding myself as a political activist, and that I was like a member of the Republican Party because of the people I was with. Yeah. Like identifying with the people that I did activism with. You always talk about how it would have been cool if we had met earlier, but if you were, I w- wouldn't have been near you with a 10 foot pole if I had thought you were one of, you know. What? You know, I, you know, cause I, cause I just wouldn't have associated with someone who was like called herself a Republican, even if she didn't know what she meant by it. Or oh, well, my, even I think if it I didn't left, mean the same thing. I, I left the Republican party by 1990. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm getting to that part. I know, All right, sorry. I'm, I'm easily as long-winded as you are. Um, <laughs> That's why we get along. We so, haven't even talked about a wrinkle in time more this week, but anyway. No. <laughs> maybe I need to tell the podcast. <laughs> keep, keep going. <laughs> um, but no, I um, started doing like various political work and I'd volunteer for campaigns, and I volunteered for Lowell Wikers <laughs> campaigns, um, who was actually friends with my parents and was... Um, um, they were also friends with Chris Dodd, just to be clear. I don't want to impugn their part, <laughs> nonpartisan positioning. Yeah. Um, but they were buttering their bread on both sides. Both sides. Yeah. And actually, I should, I should be very clear. My mother was friends with Chris Dodd's first wife. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, but um, I so I would volunteer on the Weicker campaign when he was in the Senate and uh, worked on the campaign where he lost to Joe fucking Light. <laughs> <laughs> Lieberman. Lieberman. <laughs> Lie, man. And um, still bitter about that. Um, so, yeah, I, re- I remember uh, when Lieberman was. Uh, 
<laughs> left us in it finally. Uh, you were it was just like ding dong the witch we're is just dead. dead. <laughs> oh, God. You're such you a were scumbag. on the phone with your brother, you're like, Yeah, yeah. We're yeah, yeah. I got I got clip, newspaper clippings as greeting cards. <laughs> um, We're not Joe Lieberman fans. No, 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 no. no. To, to me, actually, that was a big reason why Gore sunk his campaign. But without yeah. question, yeah, that was like although a, you know he was more than qualified to destroy it himself. Destroy, he could destroy his own campaign all by himself. <laughs> but Lieberman he didn't need certainly, any help. certainly didn't help. But he went the extra mile and brought on yeah, Joe Lieberman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. I shouldn't. I shouldn't intentionally mispronounce his name. That's rude. Joe Lieberman is his name. <laughs> we wouldn't want to be rude. No. <laughs> um, but after that, uh, Lowell Weicker ran for governor and won, and I was active in that campaign. And when I left the Republican Party, when he did, this was the com- campaign. Was this who? Who was the campaign with the governor, or not a governess? Oh, that was early. That was long ago. That was Ella Grasso, first female governor in the United States. Uh-huh. She um, campaigned against a guy whose name I don't even remember, and his lost to history. Lost, <laughs> lost to history, but basically, his campaign was that Connecticut needs a governor, not a governess. Yeah, that was uh, that was his campaign. <laughs> decided that. That being a Neander, Mis- a Neanderthal <laughs> misogynist was the way to ride well, to victory. <laughs> back then, it would have been called a male chauvinist, right? Pig, male chauvinist, pig. Male chauvinist, pig. This was the early seventies. Yeah, um, a lot of people maligned her as being sort of like you know, mobbed up and mafioso because she was Italian. Oh, but, of course, um, that's you know why not play on that stereotype? Too? Yeah, that could be fun. Um, but Although Kamala Harris is a cop, just to be clear. Just anyway, be clear. as a side note. Um, the the thing that I really noticed that really turned me sour on the Republican Party mm-hmm. and really sort of I just abandoned major party partisan politics at that time. Yep. And really the next campaign I actually worked on was an independent campaign. Yeah. Um, where it was twofold. The Republican Party turned against uh, Lowell Weicker when he campaigned to end price fixing in the state of Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, there mm-hmm. was a thing, grocery ch- grocery store chains... Um, like he uh, he was agitating on a state level with state legislators to do this, right? Yeah. And organizing on a state level to do this. So if you look in, um, say, West Hartford, which is a Tony suburb, yeah, um, at a, a shop right, mm-hmm. the price of milk is a dollar. And if you look at a shop right inside the city boundaries of Hartford, where it's uh, most accessible by public transit, the price of milk is two fifty. Yeah. It's the same milk yeah. from the same supplier being sold by the same grocery store chain. But they know that the people buying it inside the city of Hartford are captive. Are captive. They can't yeah. shop for price. Yeah. And they know that their West Hartford um, customers can shop around. They'll drive to find a... Right. They'll drive a few, several miles to find cheaper right. milk. So he was organizing legislation about this mm. um, and, and helping make that happen. Because this was happening at a state level. And he was a... a, a Senate in the United States Senate. So this kind of issue about, like, um, you might now call it food deserts, right? right. You were way ahead of the curve because most people weren't talking about we're that until the that. 90s at least. Right. So then this was, this was the late 80s. Or 20, even the 2010s, honestly. And then um, the way, much like I've seen Democrats do with black candidates, um, to just sort of like, they went, the black candidate went to the primary their favorite candidate didn't win the primary mm-hmm. and then the party will abandon them for the election cycle yeah as yeah, in they not, would not support them, not support them not do it not send any yard signs not do any of the legwork that a party's supposed to do for you right. um they will so basically if their preferred candidate didn't win the primary they just pretend no one's running because they'd rather a republican throw the win. election they'd rather yeah. throw the election than have the black candidate win mm-hmm I've seen this over and over again. Yeah. Um, the Republicans yeah. did that to Weicker when he kind of crossed that uh, class line. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, he, mm-hmm. he, he, this was a transgression. Well, you could make the case that the party kind of did it to Hillary in Michigan, right? Yeah. When, yeah, rather than support Sanders, right? So, right, right. But anyway. So. So, the, um, um, so it's a... The Republican Party basically turned on him and abandoned him in his um, election fight with uh, uh, Joe Lieberman for the Senate. Mm-hmm. 
and when when I saw those things unfold and I saw the way things were happening, because even then I was I wasn't twelve years old anymore. I was like eighteen or so. Um, I understood the nature of what was happening in these political conversations behind the scenes, and the way he was being abandoned in the general election, and that this was payback for this sort of like um, organizing that he was doing around poverty issues. And also, it was it was Weicker from the Senate floor as a Republican saying, you know, these conversations we're having about welfare queens and about food stamps are absurd. These are dog whistles. These are dog whistles that are absurd. We are talking about one-tenth of one percent of the whole budget. If we erased the program, the budget would still be out of balance. Yeah, we need to right. shut up and do our job. Right. What is, um, what is the... The federal number for food stamps, it's like, it's less than 2% of... It's, it, no, really. I think at this point, it may be as high as, it may be as high as 1.5% of the budget. Yeah. yeah. At, in the 80s, we were talking about 1% of the budget, mm -hmm. or less. If you look at all food programs going through the USDA, not yeah, just food stamps, right? Right, right. Um, So, that kind of advocate... So, in other words, he wasn't holding the party line of uh, demonizing poverty... And right. instead was talking about balancing the budget right. on, God bless him, the military. He wasn't taking the uh, DLC position. Right. Or the, the Clinton. The know. Clinton position. No, he wasn't adopting that, right? So, um, so they basically just left him hanging. And when I saw that they had a very well-established senator, a very well-respected senator, um, who was doing lots of good work mm -hmm. and was a Republican— and had Republican values. Yeah. But somehow he was going to be twisting in the wind if he was not, like, I don't know, pro-poverty? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, you know... Well, and, and wasn't, wasn't expressing the um, the sort of uh, consensus position, the Beltway consensus the Beltway position consensus on position. poverty, which is that they the poor it, need to be shamed. They need to be shamed, that's, right. That's the solution. And, and it was it was less... He wasn't like this... And, and welfare has become too comfortable. Too comfortable. Right? And let... Let me not, I don't want to uh, um, offer a hagiography. I don't want to misrepresent him. He was not some uh, Bible-thumping, full of righteous anger, food for the poor guy. Mm -hmm. He was just saying, this is a stupid conversation. We need to look at the military budget. Yeah, That's where we're out of whack here, right? I mean, that's really all he was saying. He was probably a pro-business, you know, in every other way, right? So. Yeah, and lots of, I think pretty much in every other way. Um, and um, but maybe he had some reservoir of decency somewhere. In oh, I think he had a good reservoir of decency. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about him. Um, because I, I I did have I did and do have a lot of respect for him as as a politician, one of the few that I do respect. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so that became the reason why I had to leave the party. If this is what the party's really about, that you know, yeah. we're not about, you know being responsible stewards if we're not about um shrinking our war budget so we can work and take care of americans mm -hmm. this isn't what i'm about that's not why i'm here that's yeah. not what i this is why i came to the party and you were how old i was 18 yeah i mean <laughs> you were exceptional in many ways i mean very few 18 year olds are are thinking about politics at all at 18 I, I and you were doing it for you were an old hand at this. <laughs> this was yeah. This was like my third <laughs> election cycle that I worked on a campaign. You couldn't even vote yet. Or this was your first special, year to vote. Right, right. right. So the um, so that was really sort of a, a, my moment of disillusionment there, and part of my respect for Weicker was when he did run as an independent and he was governor of Connecticut, and Connecticut's ballot was not ballot um. Budget was not balanced. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, let's try an income tax and we'll make it time limited. It'll go away. And you told me the result was that he got spat on like... Spat on in public. Like the supposed alleged legendary returning Vietnam vets being spat on as baby killers. No, he was actually spat on. Yeah. Like he couldn't go to work without running through a gauntlet of just vile, <sighs> you know, just real lot of public harassment over this over an income tax over yeah of, a state level income tax yeah um, some it was some relatively modest rel i think when i was earning twenty thousand dollars a year i paid two dollars for the year <laughs> that was the state yeah. income tax well you were probably just barely over the um the, like the threshold to pay tax yeah right, right. um so 
And the idea was, we'll balance the budget. We won't make any business taxes. You know, this was the sort of like the the real sweet spot compromise position. And in three years, mm-hmm. it would expire. It would expire, and you have to take a positive action for us to have an income tax again. Mm-hmm. So it expired after he left office, and every Republican that was in office on the state level made it permanent. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, of course. So, right, right? Because right. they love that money. They love that money right. so much. Um, so, and it was really um, contra the Republican consensus at the time that yeah. you would have any kind of personal income tax whatsoever. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, I think just about... Every municipality in the country probably needs that. Needs an income tax, yeah. See, and I would, and I would actually personally, I would argue against an income tax, and I would talk about corporate tax. Okay, that but was they a, need revenue, and they're uh, most exactly. most municipalities are not getting revenue. Are getting the revenue they need, and that was his take. And, and, and that was they're his starving for it. Their infrastructure, their right. their programs, their everything. Was that the state needed revenue? We can collect it this way and not drive away business by making it a corporate tax, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but my respect for him so it was still as a legislator, a pro, pro business it was still position, a pro, it was still a pro business position, really. Um, was that he was willing to buck consensus? Yeah. And do what needed to be done to meet public needs. And he was uh, fiscal conservative. Yes. Right. Yes, he was. Right. So that turning point for me where i was like i don't know so i guess i'm not one of them i would was really quite confident i was not a democrat um i just looked at all the democrats around me and i just didn't see any home there um they all seemed really comfortable with the war machine Mm -hmm. um and really this was the beginning of the clinton administration at this point moving into the beginning of the clinton administration and i i just um I didn't see any any space where I was could identify myself as a member of the Democratic Party. Yeah, yeah. Not in, in like in any terms. I, I was in the lead up to the '92 election. I was pretty excited for Clinton. Um, I had read. <clears throat> actually i wanted to vote for gore i had read mm-hmm. earth in the balance i had a copy of earth in the balance and i had read reinventing government and i had a copy of that and i was really intrigued by gore's proposals to streamline you know procurement and all these know, things deduplicate bureaucratic you know overhead and all this mm-hmm. and streamline government it seemed very common sense to me and interesting yeah if wonky right yeah, yeah wonky's okay and uh i you know stood outside to hear uh clinton speak in front of rackham mm-hmm. not on the steps of the michigan union like jfk did <laughs> but in front of rackham i stayed mm-hmm. up late and listened to an endless series of speakers introducing him um, oh boy, there's more. Yeah, there's until more. he finally showed up on election night. Wow. So and that there was a certain excitement to that, you know. Wait, he was he was in Ann Arbor on election night? Bill Clinton was in Ann Arbor, Michigan on election night. Nineteen ninety two. Yeah. How did I, I not know that? Okay. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'll have to verify that I, I'm probably dead wrong, but that's how I remember it anyway. Yeah, fair um, but he was everyone was talking about how he was because Kennedy gave a favorite uh, f- famous famous speech. speech on the steps of the Michigan, Michigan Union. Union. Yeah. All right. So, anyway, um, so I was excited by the uh, the Clinton administration on paper, you know, in right. theory, right? right? What they're promising. Mm-hmm. What emerged, you know, uh, over gross. the course of the two terms and all that was was not what I wanted and not what I had in mind, and no. it became gradually clear that. Uh, it was this huge capitulation to really toxic right wing values, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, really gross stuff. And you know, talk about balancing budgets on the backs of the poor, you know, and yeah. punishing, you know, the whole Ricky Ray Rector thing, the whole like, you know, 
prison industrial complex, complex thing, thing the whole you know welfare uh, to work thing all the yeah the whole the whole um basically the whole dlc program you know yeah it was, it was pretty which became gross. the the democratic party the program. way of the clintons yes you know and it's all awful yeah and i mean and, and pernicious in that the people who would ostensibly vote against this are now cheering for it yeah yeah so it was a way of co-opting an entire party wing you know and yeah. and to uh to support programs that they would have been opposing had they been not <laughs> not championed by their their team yeah not and in coded language right you know uh, yeah yeah well, so it's, so it's it's a whole that's that's a whole you know we could do multiple we shows we could do multiple on the, shows the, on that alone the DLC and the DCCC and the Clintons uh, History, and issues in that history. But that's let's just say, say, by the time it got to be 2016, there was absolutely no way in hell I was going to vote for Clinton <laughs> because I was aware, already well aware of the Clintons. Well, yeah, you, you know, seeing everything they had, yeah, and uh, made your decision. So I did not vote for <clears throat> Bill Clinton in 1992, and um, I did, but it was not. Uh, didn't, I regret it now. <laughs> wasn't excited about. Um, joining the Democratic Party and now that I've left uh, the Republicans and was and really at that point I was just kind of politically homeless I'm not even sure I'm willing to join the DSA you know I, I know what you mean I, I I know that I'm not I've just never been a joiner either so I was it's kind of habit. I, I don't want to say rudderless exactly I still did a lot of activism I still did um, I got involved in a lot of um, LGBT activism yeah and yeah. um these were good years. They were fruitful years. And I started looking uh, spiritually because the people that I, the other group of people that I was hanging out with doing activism and anti-war stuff were, were uh, nuns. Mm -hmm. And I was I mm -hmm. always admired the nuns and I'd yeah. always uh, appreciated their witness and, and uh, pacifist Mennonites. And I'd always uh, really appreciated their, their witness for nonviolence and for um, uh, being opposed to war. Yeah, consistently. Consistently, and basically, That's just, you know, let's suppose the Republican wars and support the Democrat wars. No, they they had a very consistent anti-war voice and a very consistent pro-life voice, effectively. Yeah, and was and I remember discussing at length because I was pro-choice at the time. Yeah, discussing with these folks all at length, and a lot of Republicans have always been pro-choice. You folks just understand that pro-choice, but not necessarily like. Uh, they really, don't vote that way, or well, they don't necessarily support the whole, the whole pro-choice agenda, or the, I'm sorry, the whole pro-life agenda, agenda, right? Which includes, you know, opposition to the death penalty, right? Right, right. the whole Catholic social teaching, right? The, oh, but no, a lot of there are a number of Republicans who are explicitly pro-choice uh, on abortion. Yes, and you know, I was at that time, mm -hmm. and. Um, talked at length with them about that and about my, my pro-choice views. And um, it was really their witness that began to win me over. So you actually, you were not a newbie. You didn't just come up with one set of views about this. You sort of actually shifted. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Um, and, um, I don't think most people do that. I well, think they're catechized one way and they stay that they way. They stay that way. Well, I'm, I'm open to the evidence. Yeah, I always have been. <laughs> Just I'm open to the evidence. I'm open to an argument. Like, mm -hmm. to, and, and that's the thing I've always said to you about abortion. After all these years on abortion, you'd right? love to hear a new argument. I'd love to hear a new argument. I'm always yeah. listening. I'd no, love to if, hear a new if argument. If you've been a lot of these things, if you've been active in them and reading about them for decades, there's nothing new. There's nothing new. It's it gets just, pretty tired. It's, right? it's, it is tiring. It's depressing. Like, oh, oh, so that argument again? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, no, it's it's literally demoralizing to read the same, same thing over and over again. Especially stuff that was you thought was consigned to the dustbin of history. It's right. Kind of we're like still doing back. this. We're still talking. Oh, we're still doing eugenics. Okay, <sighs> well, let's some more. Good. A lot of that stuff uh, is. Not not about abortion per se, but just these ideas ideas well and truly consigned to the dustbin of history. Like you know, you have Jordan Peterson and people like that, right? And they're just rehashing, pulling it out again, old gibberish. You Getting know. going again, yeah, more of that again. So, so um, 
that began so my journey to Catholicism began in that space where I was mm. just kind of wondering and not really sure and i um I never found a home in Judaism um, yeah, yeah and I should just clarify American Jews uh decided at some point in mid century shortly after the Second World War in the United States they were going to pass for white yeah they were going to assimilate enough into American culture that they passed as white yeah which meant there's really no, and there was already a very marginalized space for non-white Jews within Judaism in the United States before the Second World War. But in the post-war era, it really became uh, a given Mm -hmm. that Jews came to understand themselves as white and would in public present as white. Yeah. And... um, so the space for people who were Jewish but not uh, fair-skinned mm-hmm. shrank to, to almost nothing, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so I never really found a home in Judaism. Yeah. And um, well, until recently, right? Well, well actually, there was when my my father died, and I told my friend who was a rabbi that I needed to know what to do. And he's like, "Oh, you should have said something. <laughs> Why didn't you say something?" Yeah. And I was like, "Well, you know, I I." I'd done other things religiously. I'm sorry, you know. Right. Um, and, and they were very supportive and really, really gave me a, a great space to, to mourn my father. Yeah. Um, yeah. But since then, too, you found like biracial Jewish. Oh, groups yeah. I'm, I'm, online. A, I'm active with the, the Multiracial Jew, uh, Jewish Network. And I keep wanting to go to their uh, reunion and their like annual retreat. Mm-hmm. But I, since I don't practice, I feel weird. I think I, I, I think they about, would be very welcoming, even if you don't practice or know well, really all that much about what you're doing. Well, I, <laughs> you know, I practice more Judaism than any of my secular Jewish friends do. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm more actively Jewish than they are. Right. I mean, we we were doing a regular Passover meal. Thing, oh yeah, and yeah. that was great. I really liked that. So the um, so <clears throat> the th- the space that was all then left for me was to explore my mother's faith tradition. Yeah, uh, she was uh, yeah. an Anglican. Yeah. And um, I did, and I was really, I was drawn to Catholicism at the time, and I was drawn to Catholicism in high school and college. All my Catholic friends were like, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> no. it's not, nobody hates Catholics like a former no, Catholic. No, no one. Yeah. And so I was like, well, I guess I could just be an Episcopalian. That that could work. Mm-hmm. And so I was, and I did. And I, you know, kind of went full in, and I did a lot of exploration. I did, I studied some theology, and... Um, uh, it was in sort of the late 90s I became aware of Dorothy Day mm-hmm. and the Catholic Worker Movement. And I was kind of like, you know, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. I really think yeah. this is where I'm supposed to be. You felt inspired by her. Inspired and just sort of this sense of, of uh, connection and being at home. Yeah. And um, a lot of the things I talked about were things we discussed over the dinner table literally in my home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the things that they cared about and that were important to them about people's inherent dignity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, so that's what led me and drew me into the Catholic Church, mm-hmm. and what and what really keeps me there. Um, Despite uh, the fact that we run into churches and priests uh, and people and issues that we don't yeah, like, all kinds you know? of issues, you know. Yeah. Um. Uh. And I don't know. Now that I'm. Now that I'm pro-life I, I don't feel like i have big beefs with the church writ large yeah i, I got an endless list of beefs with the church and you know writ small you know? and and churches churches right yeah. uh, but i'm really be here all night with my list of beefs. <laughs> um but that's what really brought me and i feel that um i i aspire to be a catholic worker i wouldn't uh have the hebrews to call myself that i don't mm-hmm. do, i don't work very hard um <laughs> But I, You're a Catholic slacker. Catholic slacker. <laughs> My wife is going to found the Catholic, Catholic slacker, slacker movement. <laughs> That's me. You found my people. Yeah. Um, and um, I should describe the Catholic worker movement. I have a little thing here. Okay. The Catholic yeah. worker movement described in 140 words. Oh, a tweet. It's a tweet. Well, an old style tweet. Old style. The Catholic worker movement began simply enough on May 1st, May Day, 1933, when a journalist named Dorothy Day and a philosopher named Peter Morin teamed up to publish and distribute a newspaper called The Catholic Worker. This Mm -hmm. radical paper promoted the biblical promise of justice and mercy. 
Grounded in a firm belief in the God-given dignity of every human person, their movement was committed to nonviolence, voluntary poverty, and the works of mercy as a way of life. Hmm. It wasn't long before Dorothy and Peter were putting their beliefs into action, opening a house of hospitality where the homeless, the hungry, and the forsaken would always be welcome. Hmm. Over many decades, the movement has protested injustice, war, and violence of all forms. Today, there are some 228 Catholic worker communities in the United States and in counties around the world. So our home has been listed as a Catholic worker on the site. We'll our, the site. our new home? Our old home. Our old home. Um, since we moved there in 2010. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I have to update our listing. When we were looking for houses, we considered a few houses that were really much larger than we needed mm-hmm. on the grounds that, hey, we could make this a Catholic worker. Okay. In other words, it has like four extra bedrooms or something yeah, like yeah. that. That, you know, that didn't work out. They were too far from my work. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or uh, just way above the amount we could borrow. Yeah. But yeah. but it was something that we kept thinking about. Right. And we, and we do have a guest room here. Mm-hmm. And we have a guest. Yes, we have a guest now. And um, and it's because it's because it is something that we've tried to it's keep. It's one of our present. core values. One of our core values. Something we that we present. want to practice is offering hospitality to people who need it. We can't invite the whole world in and feed the whole world in our home, much as we'd like to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but we can, but feed, we a can few, feed a few at a time. Few, a few at a time. So yeah. this this practice, I, I mentioned this before, that the the practice or the praxis of engaging the works of mercy on a daily basis. Um, that's how I try to live as a Catholic worker. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, yeah, so I think that brings us to where we are now, really. Okay. That, uh, you know, I came into the Catholic Church and began to learn and live more deeply. It wasn't that big. Once I was finally there, it wasn't a big change. You didn't feel like it was a big transformation? No. It was like just a codification, a codification of what you believed and already did. What I already did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and who I've who I've in large part always been. I feel like I'm still trying to find my people. You know, like yeah, the local DSA folks that I've met. Are, there's a big split, I think, between the young ones who are mostly like grad students, yeah, and the older ones who are, you know, like ex hippies or or whatnot. You current, know, current hippies. That's <laughs> needed. Um, but there's quite a divide, you know, mm-hmm. and and um. I haven't really found like uh, I know I may join and get my membership card, but I don't Being know. Being used to be a card carrying socialist. Uh, yeah, well, but I don't know what that'll mean as far as you know. I work full time. I've got a family. I'm in a different stage of life than a grad single grad student yeah. who with um, you know, who's like an activist for on behalf of graduate workers or whatnot. Or you know, right, or, right. or the the various things they get engaged in. I I can't spend my evenings and weekends zooming around from one meeting to the next and all that. Yeah. I, I just, I've got too many dishes to wash. Yeah. So. Which I think is this, this reality that I think, um, mm-hmm. shapes organizing, but yeah, we haven't caught up to how to manage it. Right. So I, I try to do what I can, including this podcast, whether yeah. it's something I can do largely from home, mm-hmm. you know, in my non-work time, but, um, right. No driving involved. We drive a <laughs> but, lot already. But there's only so much I could do with this, and then it's not really setting the world on fire the way we might have hoped, at least not yet. But, um, yeah, yeah. but you know, I've talked about uh, in previous shows the sort of marching level activism stuff that I did, and we talked about the border strike and stuff like that. Yeah, but, yeah. But I'm not, you know, not have, haven't really been much of a, you know, every week I'm going to chain myself to a different bulldozer or something like that you know yeah yeah and and now you know now i'm a kind of sick 50 year old guy with a podcast and and, uh and a family (laughs) and And it's hard to know exactly yeah what it all means and what where where can you actually get traction and do good so like if i'm you know if I'm going to be performing as a folk singer, is that more effective than chaining myself to a bulldozer? Hard to say. Maybe. Or <laughs> anyway. Hard to know. So, so yeah. So that that's 
that's your that's your that's arc. my that's my arc that's my uh, sort of a little more detail in your in your arc i think so yeah well i learned some things oh that's cool that i didn't i didn't know you were involved in yeah but um okay probably you know we can hear a little girl upstairs howling yeah she needs her mom she needs her mom because we're doing this on a weeknight and she's like this is bedtime time mom. to go to sleep what's happening it's bedtime where's my mom yeah so we better say good night good night for now well thank you all for listening you've been listening to the grace and paul podcast check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com where you can leave comments or search for the grace and paul podcast on facebook or youtube